So when I got the call from the folks at BeWoke.Vote to do a series of interviews to encourage folks to vote, uh, my next guest was one of the first folks on my list. And when I say one of the first, literally in the top three because uh, of his unique story, not only being a comedian, but also uh, being someone who is very socially conscious in his comedy. Uh, comedy is all about uh, making folks think, forcing them to actually uh, own up to some serious truths. And so uh, Ali Sadiq often does that on the stage, and we're certainly glad to have him here. What's up, Doc? How you doing, buddy? I'm all good to see you. Oh, man, it's all good. It's always a pleasure to do anything with you, anything. Was also helps you. He, he's based in H-Town. So Definitely, it, it H-Town, also, proud. Being a, being a Houston native, that also helps. That, that, you know, you got to have a little... A little sugar on it, you know. People call you for a certain reason. Right, but it, but but how in the hell you didn't bring any French's chicken? Man, I wasn't at home. I was in Dallas. Okay. I was leaving Dallas. They don't have French's in Dallas. They got yeah, um, they, they, they got, got that other. Yeah. I, I don't even want to mention. I don't yeah. Know, Williams. It is. Yes, it's whatever Williams it is. chicken. It's, it's not Williams. good. It ain't French's. It's not. It's definitely not French's. Okay, so I'll let you off the hook. But also, if you're gonna be in Dallas, you need to go by Sweet Georgia Brown. I didn't go to Sweet Georgia Brown's. Let me tell you why. You been there before? I've been there. Oh yeah. Bye there i've been oh, by there like a drive-by it, it, it looked it looked like a lot of diabetes in there <laughs> uh, it, let's let's just say let's just say um uh you will you 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 will not walk out of sweet georgia brown's hunger yeah you definitely won't i i didn't see people come out of there i didn't see on, on a sugar iv they had iv on <laughs> That tea, it's a tea, and it's why black places always serve some type of diabetic tea. It's like a bag of sugar. It's like we never measure the sugar at all. Right, we right. Never measure sugar. It's, just a, it's by taste, and it's like and it depends on who tasting that day. That's true. It's, that's it's true. Like, but see, I don't, I don't drink sweet tea. You don't I don't. Drink sweet tea? I don't. No, I, I just uh, that that's probably why I'm not diabetic. I don't uh, drink sweet tea. I just I like the the taste of the actual leaf. I drink several types of tea. So you want to taste the leaf, not not the sugar. Yeah, I don't want the sugar. Like I, I got, I drink dandelion tea a lot and and sour sap tea. Them, those are my favorite too. I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Hey. I, I just I just do diet snapple peach. You just diet snapple. <laughs> diet okay. snapple peach. See, I, I got one of them little things that you make your tea. You know, a little steep. You got it. You know. Oh, you fancy. Oh, I'm definitely fancy. Oh, you must have visited. You must have visited some other country and you saw them doing yeah. it. Yeah. And you said. <laughs> Y'all need to go ahead and like give me that as a gift to go back home. You know, I hang out with a lot of people who drink tea. You know, everywhere I go is some sort of tea. They don't offer coffee. They offer tea with goat's milk a lot. Cause that's old people. Yeah, I, I like old people. Old right, people that's, are I mean, wise. Right, old people drink coffee and tea. Yeah. The reason I don't drink coffee is because going to my grandparents' house when I was seven and eight had my ass drinking uh, coffee at seven and eight. That's probably why I'm like borderline uh, ADD right now. No, my daughter, uh, her, my aunt Day Day, she, you know, we used to let her baby, you know, you don't take your kids to no daycare early. You take them to your, to somebody who ain't working. Aunt Day Day. You know, yeah, Day-Day. somebody not working. You know, so Aunt Day Day keeping my baby, and my baby, she been drinking coffee since about three. At the table, I didn't, I didn't, I guess I found out at three, because she had been drinking coffee with her, with her Aunt Day Day. Just sitting at the table, old people, <laughs> pour her a cup of coffee, pour her one, two, drinking, the, uh, looking at the paper. My, my daughter been looking at the paper, drinking coffee since I recognized around three years old. Daddy, let me, give, let me get that section for you right there. <laughs> <laughs> How old is she now? She's 19 now. Wow. 19 in college. Um, so go- she's well read uh, and she's jittery. And what, what she's a chef. Oh, okay. That's what she, you know, she stay in the kitchen with that food and she keep a cup of coffee while she cook. <laughs> my Aunt Day Day didn't curse this baby. <laughs> she didn't drink ca- caffeine since two. Well, you're lucky Aunt Day Day didn't smoke. Yeah, because she had that baby. Was all <laughs> I, 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 it's amazing that I don't smoke. Because, see, I used to um, have to be with my aunts and my mom. They would play cards. And I was only there in a servitude manner, you know, to bring ice, <laughs> crown <laughs> roll, and light cigarettes. <laughs> For some reason, back in the early 80s, like, no, late 70s, early 80s, people didn't own lighters or matches. I had to light all the cigarettes on the stove. And you know, when you light a cigarette on the stove, you got to roll it and you got to pull a little bit so it'll be even. Now, after you light three cigarettes. So there's cigarettes, a technique? Yeah, it's a technique. You got to roll it a little bit, then you got to pull and make sure it's even. After you didn't lit three cigarettes, you really in there smoking now at six years old. You in there just, you know, this is stressful. At the, I'm not even playing cards, but it's, just, it's stressful for me. Because <laughs> I'm here as a servitude. Yeah. And it wasn't cards, it was bit whisk. 
definitely was biz whiz. And they didn't, I don't know why these are sisters that didn't trust each other. Go to the bathroom with their cards. <laughs> Watch her, watch my hand, fuck it. You gotta sit there and just watch the hand. I've been a watcher for a long time. I had to watch Young and the Restless for my mama. I was the first VCR. You don't realize that. I first VCR, so you gotta watch, you gotta watch the stories. Your mama come home, tell me what happened. You gotta start from the top. See now right there, see right there. You, you just lost a lot of white people. What? Because they watch soap operas. Oh they, yeah, I call it the stories. Black people watch the stories. The stories. <laughs> But it's the same characters. Right, but it's I'm saying, I'm characters. saying, but when you grow up black, they're like, you watch the stories, yeah. and your white friend is going, I'm sorry, I, what, did you read a story? Did you watch a story? And they're like, what are we talking about? No, we know, that's soap operas for yeah, they, stories. Yeah, they was a soap operas. Now, the thing about this is, when you're a young kid watching soap operas, you get influenced. That's why I think I've always thought that we supposed to have more than one woman, because Victor Newman had more than one woman. That, every time I saw it on there, he brought he had um, Vicky and uh, Ab, bring them both to the ranch at the same time. And that's also both. why black people are walking around right now, uh, and they want to have that same damn wedding Luke and Laura had. That Luke and Laura wedding, um, then we shut it down. People didn't go to work for that Luke and Laura wedding. I remember that. Right, I forget got, Princess died. And his other, the what? Meghan Markle and all them. And then Jesse, when Jesse got married, um, to who Jesse got married to? Angie. And Jesse, man, boy, you took me back. Remember, um, did you? I mean, and now, hold on, I want to see if you really pay attention. When Jesse and Angie kissed like black people kissed. You remember that? It was all yeah, they, tongue. That, that was a real. That kiss. was that was a real kiss. That, that was, was like kiss. it wasn't that somebody somebody mate was mad. They like nah, that wasn't no soap opera. No, kiss. that was like that was a real. We were watching like oh hold up, but, but, but tongues transferred. Yeah, right. Yeah. Who how, who else when we watch? Y'all have no idea what the hell we talking about, huh? I, they, they have no, no these, idea. These are the see they, they they grew up watching reality TV. Yes, yeah, so we saw that. the stories. Yeah, Victor Newman, Jack Abbott. Remember Victor knocked out Jack? Man, that was crazy. Yeah, over over um, what was the name of um the makeup company? Um, what, <laughs> you all in the storyline. Man, because see, I, I had to watch um Young and the Restless, All My Children, and General Hospital. This was an all day thing. For okay, me. so that was CBS. See, my household was probably was all ABC. So it was Ryan's Hope. It was All My Children. It was One Life to Live, and it was General Hospital. My fault. I did forget back to my, back when, my to mom, back to when back. my mama switched over. My mama switched over. She got off that guy in light and went over to that um man. Uh, who guy yeah. light? Was guy CBS. light was CBS. But how is it? We were there any black people over on NBC? Because I didn't watch any NBC soaps. Even when they created the black soap, was it Generations? Gener I didn't watch that. My mama didn't like that. Right, my it didn't. didn't like that. It yeah, didn't. after that we Price is Right, Family Feud. <laughs> 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 you guys rocked that Family Feud. You, you, you family feud to make you racist if you if you don't if you don't watch yourself. When oh I yeah, was growing up, cause you, just, you only cheer for the black family. You only, come right. on, slump, man. How you gonna let that little white man beat him to the thing? You gonna be quick. That's every black household right every there. Every black house watching it to see who gonna beat that buzzer. Right. That's that's a shame. Right. How you overbid on prices? Right. That damn high. That was one of my. That was one of the biggest jokes I ever did on HBO when I when I said black people never won on Family Feud back then. They had trick questions. <laughs> Asked that man, name a popular flavor of Kool-Aid. And I sat there in front of that TV and prayed that man wouldn't say red. <laughs> <laughs> that man hit that buzzer all that, with all the confidence in the world. Red. red. I said, oh, come on, not man. Not cherry. Yeah, not cherry. Not, not strawberry. strawberry. Red. red. It's red. <laughs> 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 that ain't make no sense that man said red on family. I just look like, man. And, it, and what the bad part was, the rest of his family to my good answer, good, good answer. answer. I'm like, that ain't no good answer. Right. It ain't. <laughs> who the hell y'all ask? Who, who y'all ask? Yes. They, they never surveyed none of my people. No, my I, people. I don't. Because half the stuff up there, I'm like, come on, man. This which, which, is why, which is why, which is why, which is why I'm glad they finally start getting rid of the SAT and the ACT test because that were just like on Family Feud. They got were, rid of it. That were question. Well, because a lot of people say, you know what, it's not really a measure of a student because that were questions on the SAT test. It was like I, no, I don't know what the hell that is. I'm sorry. I, not, not, not in a, um, above my stay rate. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I stay it, it just didn't do it. I it stay in a neighborhood it. that um, we have 13 people in this house. I don't know about um, a four bedroom. How many people you supposed to have in a four bedroom? That seems like a lot of people. I get a lot of people in a four bedroom. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's a lot. <laughs> you get a, a lot, lot of people. I mean, we had seven in my family. Then y'all, did y'all see the same thing where y'all had like other relatives who didn't get along? with their mamas and daddies who ended up staying with you 
and you had to like move out of your room because like what what the hell don't you have a, here was my deal i got a mom and daddy they're here they're here you left your mom and daddy to come here and we got to make Go. special accommodations for you now i didn't mind that because my mama my mama she was a good parent when she didn't you know she was struggling a little bit when my daddy left she had good family that she can send us to me and my sister, she sent both of us. Me and my sister, and she was sending money to, you know, to take care of us. We ain't do that. We ain't do that. Y'all ain't do that. We ain't do that. No, cause uh, <laughs> we didn't do that. My 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 daddy didn't quite. Um, my daddy was different. He he did not really um, uh, tolerate that. Matter of fact, I have absolutely no recollection ever in my life of staying at a non-relative's house. Oh. Like you know, it's like uh, like uh, spending the night. Oh yeah, I spent the night. Now, I'm talking about at a friend's house. See, you understand, my grandmother had, had eight kids, 42 grandkids. 42 grandkids. 70 great grandkids. There was no room in my life for friends. There was no room. I had enough family members. Yeah, you have no family members. Right, and so no, we, did, we didn't visit, we didn't, we didn't. In fact, again, we a little different. So like when we barbecued, we actually had barbecue. Mm. Which is like brisket, chicken, brisket, links. chicken, links. For those of you who are unwell with links, they're called sausage. Uh, <laughs> and so, and so, just like with stores and soap operas. Uh, and Got so, to be burnt. when when a family member would invite us over to the barbecue, we would get there. My dad was like, "This is some bullshit. This ain't no barbecue." He said, <laughs> he said "Some hot dogs and hamburgers." And straight up, my dad's like, "Pack this shit up. We going back home. This ain't no damn barbecue." He said, "Oh, I could." He said, oh. "He said I'm a grown ass man. We ain't doing no hot dogs and hamburgers." He said, "That's for the, that's for the kids before the meal." Yeah, so your daddy like me. See, I, I'm i one of them daddies. You can't really just go nowhere and it don't, it's not right when I get there. No, I'll pack it up. We leave. No, literally, my dad's like, we ain't got to stay he's here. like, pack this up. We're going to the house. Definitely going to the house. Now, that seems like a Neanderthal, you know, in this in this day and time. Because what today of, they call it cookout. See, these people compromise. No, no, no. It was a barbecue. Yeah, a barbecue. When I get there, we haven't, because I'm, first of all, if you come to my house with barbecue, it's, I got two pits going. I got two pits and a old, and a little old smoky pit. That's for hot dogs and hamburgers. Right. For them children. Which is the pre-meal. Yeah, pre-meal. That's in our house, that's, the kids that's ate. Snack. That's what you come right. by and get one of them hot. You're supposed to grab one of them off the smoke right. with your bare hand. It's burnt. That's the, that's the in-between yeah. snack. Yeah. Because like, even with us, the kids ate ribs, brisket, chicken, links. There it is. We ate. Regular food. Did, did you also have them family members who, when they came by, y'all hid stuff? Yeah. Like my, I, yeah. the reason, I, I really do believe the reason I do not drink to this day is because of my Uncle Warren. My Uncle Warren had a big gulp before 7-Eleven had a big gulp. <laughs> First he of all, had people the don't biggest, know big He had the biggest damn cup and it was all alcohol. I'm telling you, you, you did, I know it. Did, 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 did this happen? Relative dro drive up. Honk the horn. Oh shit, that's Uncle Warren. Go hide all my good liquor. And so we would go hide the good liquor. And we and so in like between them getting out of the car and making it to the doorstep, three things could happen. We could hide all the good liquor. We could hide all of the good desserts. And we could clean the living room and the kitchen and the hallway in the time it took them from getting out of the car to the doorstep. Pat. Doc, my dad had straight up military operation going. <laughs> straight up. I'm straight I, up. I'm just trying to tell yeah. you. Uh, uh, Co-op go, hey, go. And y'all and y'all oh, yeah. knew what to do. Five of us. Five. Oh, yeah, it's five of y'all. Y'all can do a lot. It's remember, five that, people. No, no, but there was no conversation. Oh, ain't no conversation. It was like vacuum cleaner, broom, fold, hot liquor, hot cakes. <laughs> Boom. Everybody had it. Everybody had a job. Everybody had a job. You a special assignment yeah. child. Because we had some other relatives who they would come because they would like to pack stuff up. My dad was like, no, I didn't, he said, I'm, you're not going to plan your meals for the rest of the week on me. See, the thing is, my family, they drank and they brought their own liquor. So you didn't have to hide. See, that's what my, I'm saying. So they coming in lit. That's what I'm saying. My uncle. So all my, you had to do was do the setup. Oh, the setup. Okay, so let me do this here. For all the people who are uh, not black, <laughs> for all, of the, and all for the black people who are under the age of 35. Under age 35. What a setup is, is when your mama and daddy back in the day used to go out to a club and then you could bring your own liquor, but you had to buy the setup. The setup was a bucket of ice. ice. And it was lemon and lime and cherries. And it was a white bucket. 
That's what a setup was. Setup. See? Setup. And I and I was a pro at setting up lemons, limes, and the cherries. You had to just put them out the little thing, just in your hand, put them in the thing, ice, bring a stack of cups, sit there, and when them cups get low and ice get low, I just come in there easy. You know, I, I was I, I was always could be a shadow in this room. That's how I used to drink liquor with them, they didn't know. Yeah, because when they get it out, yeah, you know, I'm smoking cigarettes, drinking liquor since six. Since six. Because I'm there in the servitude manner. They By the time you got to high school, you really were about 38. Yeah, I was really 38. <laughs> I, I was really 38 in high school. I was an old man by the time I got to high school. But my dad, man, and see, what's crazy, I, my mama made a mistake when she let me live with my daddy for one, one year. Because my daddy, he was a, a awful parent. He was like the worst. He didn't know what he was doing. So he didn't wash clothes one time. And back in the day, this is like 19, we're going to go 83. 83, 84. 83. That was, uh, that was Jackson 5 in the Victory Tour. Yeah. Billy Ocean was out, though, too. See, me, I don't know. Billy Ocean popped out of nowhere. And my daddy, everybody in my daddy's generation fell in love with Billy Ocean. They had them look, that, that, that small little curl, that low curl. And they in bikini draws that came out that year. I'll never forget this, because bikini draws came out 83, 84. Um, my daddy didn't wash clothes. So I come, I say, hey, man, I got no underwear. My daddy say, well, go in my top draw and put on some of the bikini draws. I said, no, nah, I really don't like bikini draws. I don't like Bill Ocean. You know, you like Caribbean Queen. That's your jam. Um, so my daddy made me wear some bikini draws, but he don't really understand. I'm in school and you got to dress out for gym. So you yes. got to dress out for gym. You got to take. So now my partner see okay, me. Hold on one second. For everybody who's <laughs> under 35. Dressing out for gym was a concept that when you were in school, there was a thing called physical education, which was required. These days, they don't they have any physical education. Nothing. So therefore, what you wear to school is what you wear home. Continue. <laughs> so I got to dress out for gyms. I got to put these shorts on. And I totally forget that I got these panted like draws on. So my boy, Denard, you know, Denard is not a combination. You know this is old. Denard used to be sick. Don't nobody call it kid Denard no more. And then I said, boy, you got on panties? I was like, no, uh, you know, Billy Ocean, Caribbean. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, first of all, I don't know that song and don't ever do that in front of me. I was like, my daddy, these are my daddy draws, first of all. And man, I was so mad at my daddy, man. I still, till to this day, I don't like bikinis, I don't like bikini draws, and I don't like Billy Ocean. <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned your mother, you mentioned your father. Growing up was... Voting was community engagement. Was that a part of your life? Nah, I, I didn't really hear a lot of people talking about voting growing up. It wasn't a, a conversation. It was always who in office, but you never knew how they got there. They just like, see, they didn't put this man in office. And I'm like, who is they put him in office? That's all I used to hear was they put this man in office. They ain't nobody in office for us. Okay, but so, so it was, all, it was always they. They. But they was never, it, 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 was, it was never defined. It was never defined. And, 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 and did, did anybody even own up to, I'm part of they? No. It was just a they in office, they ain't gonna let us, them, look what they did, them folks there. It was never like, who are them, they, and those? Who are these people? And when you grow, I, I didn't even find out about voting, which is, which is oddly enough how important voting was, I found out about how important voting was in prison. Dead serious. Dead serious. Old man in prison say, hey, brother, you ought to try to persuade your people to vote for Ann Richards because she can't run again. This is her last term. Now, if she win, then all she going to do is just steal money. You know what I'm saying? While she getting out of office. Now, if Bush get in office, boy, ain't nobody going on. The first thing a politician said, I'm gonna be tough on crime, tough on crime. And riches. <laughs> so I didn't really understand the concept. How old were you? I was in jail, so I was 19. You were 19, you went in at what age? 19. 19, mm -hmm. you went in jail for? Drug trafficking. So you go in jail, and 19 years ago, between car games and family get-togethers and wearing uh, bikini pant draws and all that sort of stuff. And I'm in them streets. I'm in the streets hustling. Um, and what's crazy, your neighborhood, your environment,
pushes you to the streets very early because in our neighborhood, this is the only place that you hear that you gotta get out of here at 18. So in your mind, you 13 when you hear this. You got five more years until right. you on your own. So is school important or hustling to get some bread? Because at 18, I gotta get out this lady house and I don't know where I'm going or what I'm gonna do. So it wasn't go to college. It wasn't get a job, go to the, go to the army, go to the military. Mm -hmm. It was, you gotta be out this house. You gotta be out this house. And that was a common thing growing up in, in that time. You gotta get out this house, you know, what you gonna do? But you gotta get out, I don't know what you gonna do, but you gotta get out this house at 18. So when it's common, so you go to prison at 19, yeah. sentence for how long? 15 years. And you're, for the first time you're hearing this old man talk about voting. Mm -hmm. What did you say? What's that? What's that? And why does that make a difference? What did he say? And he broke the Ann Richards thing down to me. About they gonna be stealing money. He said, and his thing was about people getting out. He said, man, a lot of people gonna be here that's not gonna get out because Bush is gonna come in and he gonna set off all these people's sentences just to show that he's tough on crime to get favor with whoever put him in office. <clears throat> Made sense to me once he broke it down. Then I start reading about voting and the importance of voting, just talking with them. Because these are men who probably marched for voting, probably something went wrong in their life, they still ended up in this place. But there was a lot of knowledgeable people there, and I just hung with the old cats that had all this information. Hey, man, when you get out, this is what needs to happen. This is what's not in the community. This is the reason why you're here. You know what I'm saying? You don't, you don't see it like this, you know? And I'm like, man, wow. That was, that, was, that was deep, what you just said. And I'm still young and wild in there. And I didn't understand that these old cats, because I was one of the only young people that was still listening. Like, you could still talk to me. I was still, huh, what's he saying? It, I wasn't at this point where what you said didn't have no weight to me. Like, I, I wasn't a lost cause. So they came up with this plan unbeknownst to me. I didn't find out about it until it, they had already accomplished their goal. The man said that I was so wild on this unit, dude named Blackshirt, he said, we can't got together, we say once we get him, then we get the rest of the youngsters. You know what I'm saying? And he said, when I said that, you was on the wreck yard fighting when I said it. He said, like, he said look at him, the little wild crazy one. That's what we got to get. So a, so a group of old men. old men in prison said, if we break him yep. and put him back together and mold him, it's going to be a domino effect. He'd get everybody else. Is that what happened? That's what happened. Six different units, though. They didn't know what they started. Every time they moved me from a, a unit, I changed the unit. They would just have to move me. And so when you have somebody who so powerful that I'll never forget it. You was at the Million Man March. Yep. I'm in prison. We supporting from prison and showing unity because I put together a plan. This guy named Lewis, Lewis McKenzie. I, he was the first person I told. I woke up, I say, Lewis, man, they got this Million Man March and we not going to be a part of it. We can't be a part of it but we gotta show some type of solidarity. I said, man, I, I, don't, I don't want nobody black to go in that, in, that, um, in that cafeteria. On that day, October 16th, I don't want nobody in that cafeteria. Breakfast, lunch, or dinner, I think we can feed each other. I think we can do it. He said, boy, you pull that off, they gonna move you. And I said, I think I can do it. And we did it. And I think that was the only time I ever shed a tear in prison. Because I got up that morning and walked on that rec yard. And I didn't see, from six different buildings, I didn't see one black inmate walk into that cafeteria. Even the people who was cooking the food didn't eat in there. And I knew they found out about it because on that, on that day, you know, you got people working in the kitchen. Spaghetti was on the menu and they changed it from spaghetti to fried chicken. And it wasn't because, oh, it's a black thing. That's the only time that you get a whole piece of chicken and it'll be another month before you get it. And the funniest thing, Haleem, his brother named Haleem, he was cooking and he had stole out the kitchen all his chicken. He said, now you told me not to eat it in there. 
she ain't say nothing about taking it back to this, to this, to this bringing it back to this block. And it was so powerful that the Hispanics came and said, hey, next time y'all do that, we gonna do it with you. Because that was the only way we could show some strength. You gotta throw away 30, 40, $50,000 worth of food. And you gotta explain why they ain't eating. What's going on? Why they ain't eating? We, we spent every dollar we had to feed each other. And when people was coming out from the fields, it was amazing to see them turn away from that child hall and go back to their blocks. And brothers had already made spreads, like just come over here, we got you. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we got you. And that was a big thing to me. Then I, moved, I got moved. Then I got to another unit, they was riding. Every other week they was riding. And I was like, nah, we can't live like this. Y'all fighting behind nothing. And I was so sarcastic. I was like, hey, man, this is what we, we this is what we not going to do. We're not going to let them keep gassing us, you know what I'm saying, because y'all want to fight. Next person put their hands on somebody here that's black, you're going to have to deal with a lot of us. You're going to have to deal with a lot of us. And the Muslim brothers was like, he's already told y'all what's going to happen. We not doing this no more. Ain't no more being locked down and being further locked down. Like that, it didn't make sense. So I think I was one of the youngest coordinators inside the institution. And the biggest thing was Monday Night Football was when the Crips and the Bloods that was in Hondu, Texas on Torres unit met every Monday and exchanged books right before Monday Night Football. And it was a mandate on Torres unit. And everybody noticed that was on Torres unit at that time. If you was under the age of 22 years old. Now, did you create that? Yeah. If you was under the age of 22 years old, from the age of 18 to 22 years old, you were not allowed to fight on this unit at all. You had to go to school. If you did not go to school, we're going to beat the shit out you until you go to school. So you choose it. It's on you. Because it's the point. You can't keep doing the same act and going back into the world. Because I'm... I was one of the young people that was sent here to this unit with the old people, because I was around old school cats. I came from Ellis One, Ellis Two, Darrington Unit, Bill Clemens, and my mindset was, you're not gonna be here forever, so you got to start preparing yourself in here for out there. It's no getting out and then start the race. No, everybody else is already running. So when people say these reform things or what we gonna do once somebody get out. You have to change the mindset of the individual in there. I knew me, this is not the place for me. I knew that, I was like, if they would've showed me intake, I would've never sold drugs ever in life. If they would've just showed me intake. Intake is the closest thing to slavery that you will ever be a part of. What is it? It's when they book you into the prison. You're stripped down naked. You're placed, man, first of all, the trip there is the, is the, is the same trip as the ship. They take, they, they replace- As a slave ship. They replace the ship with a bus. So you on a bus, you shack up to somebody else. If they gotta go to the restroom, you gotta go to the restroom. Mm -hmm. They gotta do number two, you gotta stand there. If they gotta do number one, you there with them. You shack up to this person. You get off the bus, you shack, you, they unshackle you, they put you through this thing, they strip you down naked. And they got this thing where they call, they want you heel or toe. So you naked and your toes are touching the man's heels in front of you. So that's easily that your private area is touching and somebody's right behind you. So now they shave your head down bald. Now open your mouth. They detox you. Same like when you saw on slave, they throw that flower and they detox you, bathe you, go in your mouth. You not already bathed and been shaved. They still go in your mouth, go in your anal, lift up, cough up, everything. Then they house you. They give you a number. And this number is branded into your brain. It's bra this, I know this number better than I know my social security number. Your inmate number. Yeah, and I've, and I've tried to forget it. One time I thought I did forget it. And it is? 679346. You're and known it, by that, not your name. Not your name. You say it, you say it every time you move it. That's your, that's your identity. 67, 93, 
it kills me that I even know it. It kills me not even know it, man. It's just, a, it's um, a scar. Like when I when I hear other people talk about, like I heard Cat Williams say it on a show, I got 19 felonies. Why are you glorifying that? But you've never been in jail, so that's why you glorifying 19 well, felonies. Well, he said that in an interview with, with uh, Frank and Wanda, he said, well, no, I, he said, I've been in jail, but I haven't been in prison. As if that was a... Like, that's a good thing. Why even having 19 felonies? Because you have people looking up to you, and they think that that's the way to go. That's why it took me... I've been doing stand-up 20 years. It took me 17 years for I even do one story about prison. Because I didn't want people to think I was some one-trick pony. Oh, all he has been to jail, that's it. So then you got Meek Mills come out, crying about being in jail for five months because um, you willying down the street in New York on a, on, a, on a dirt bike. And then you talking about you the voice for people who had no voice. You're not the voice for me. Who the fuck are you? You ain't got one scar, not one mental scar, not one physical scar, not one internal scar from that place because you was in jail. You was on probation. And then what you had people saying, free Meek Mills and do not give you this, this, this glory. But what you were doing, my friend, was incorrect. If that lady wanted to violate you, somebody who was on parole, if that lady wanted to violate you, she could have violated you every time she saw you smoking weed in the video. Every time you was out of town without permission. If she was against you, but see, that's not what you, that's not what you gonna say to the people. So you on Lester Holt talking about you the voice for who? Not for me. And I really did it. You ain't did nothing. You served how long? I served six on a 15. And then walked the rest on the street. With a, and when you walk on the street with it, it's even more detrimental because you don't want nobody to know your name. You don't want nobody to know nothing about you. You move, because somebody can easily say this, Ali did something to me and now it's my job to prove that I didn't. Guilty now you want to financially strap me? You want to financially strap me to, to fight that I didn't do something just because somebody decided that they didn't like me or they, or, or I said something they ain't like, or some girl like me that he, it, it, whatever the excuse may be. Now I got the fight. You gonna just come pick me up. Excuse my daughter is in school. Excuse that everything that I'm doing in my life, you just gonna uproot me and put me back in a, in a cage. And I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not for that. It, see, it, that place creates a, a type of human being that people are really not prepared for. I understand and it's not fictitious with, with me. If you choose to accuse me of something wrong, I'm probably going to hold court in the street. And you're going to have, you're going to, it's nothing that you can do to me because I understand who I am in when, when, the, when the odds are not in my favor. Even in that, in that place, officers knew, hey, if we cross him, He's going to be a handful because he's already made his declaration. Hey, man, before I let y'all take anything from me, I will die in here as a man before I let you take an inch from me. Let's go for inmate. Let's go for officer and whoever try to buck the system. Because now you've created, a, you took a nonviolent offender, you put him in a, a violent place, and you think that I'm not going to become a, a formidable opponent? No, I'm gonna just galvanize to the place that I'm at. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna start to act like the place that I'm in until somebody pull my hand and say, young man, you don't belong here. I just want just, nah, we ain't gotta talk right now. I just wanna let you know, out of everybody here, I've been here 27 years, you don't belong here. And we'll talk after you calm down. What you mean I don't belong here? He said, man, I saw you when you came in that gate. And I didn't say nothing about something weak about you, nothing. I knew you didn't belong here because you still got light in your eyes. I said, what? He said, you still got light in your eyyes. Man, I watched you one day on the wreck yard, man. You were just happy. You was by yourself walking around out there happy. I said, that little brother still got it. He, you not no hardened criminal. He said, I guarantee you, everything you did, you was with somebody. Everything you did, you was with somebody. Everything I did, I was, did it by myself. I was hardened by the streets, and I know you're not like that. And 
when somebody talked to you and you, your father didn't really give you good conversation, you know, so you, you now you're talking to like somebody that's like your grandfather and he's an old man. He really, he real live got your best interest at hand. I want you to get out of this place and be what you're supposed to be. Because this ain't you, my friend. You know, just, just watch. If you just change the narrative of how you walk around here, watch how many people come to you. Everybody gravitates toward We like you and we don't even know you. That's the crazy part. We like you and don't even know you. And it happened. I was just two years in, I came from this wild, crazy person to walking out. And I remember the day I said, man, what y'all in here mad for? Ain't nobody going home and slammed my door. They was like, <laughs> what? I was like, and they was like, why you come out here and say that? It's Saturday. Don't nobody go home on Saturday. Y'all still mad? It's over. Sometimes you got to start enjoying the weekend, brother. <laughs> and we here. And every day I, I had this whole thing. I would just wake up and today is going to be a better day than tomorrow. And I would just challenge people. Do you know that um, in the Civil Rights War that more people um, shitted on themselves to death than, than um, got killed by bullets? Dude, like, that ain't true. Well, look it up. We can argue all day about it. <laughs> I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start an argument about something. I hate, they know I hate the cowboys, so I'm making posters. Likewise. I'm making posters and clipping stuff. I'm I'm messing with folks all day. I got nothing to do but make people happy. Because this is my job in here. If I got nicknames for people that they got, they like, I don't even like my nickname, but everybody <laughs> know it. Big hand Rick. And he's like, his hand was huge. And I could be sitting across the room, and I'm like, come on, Rick, all that back massaging. And he's like, man, I ain't even do nothing. You are way over here. I'm like, and they people like, big hand Rick, man, stop touching on that man. <laughs> like, and he ain't even touching me. But it's just, I'm going to create a better avenue. It was like what I wanted in my neighborhood. You know, I, I grew up wanting a lot of activities in my neighborhood that was in close proximity. You know, my mom wasn't always there, so I didn't always have a ride to places and you know you want to be able to walk down the street and get to something that's some food for your soul in your community you know you know I relish you know the days of being in Clarksdale Mississippi and when I had to go out there and live with my people they had actually black owned corner stores my uncle owned one my uncle Donald owned a cleaners and a um and a corner store and he he um he a city councilman down there now and it's like that was big for him. He was like, yo, man, you got to own something. Got to own something. His wife was named Louise. It always killed me. I, I used to call him George Jefferson. His <laughs> name was Donald. Because <laughs> his wife was named Louise. And that was big to see my family own and stuff. And it just cultivated what my dad told me. My dad, it, he, not a lot. He didn't say a lot of good stuff, but the three things that he did give me, play chess so you'll be a thinker. You don't have to work for nobody. He told me that, I said, you don't have to work for nobody. The same energy that you put into, for somebody else, you can put that same energy into it for yourself. And then he'll go into his field. See, they talking about black people don't wanna work. Black people just don't want no job. You know what I'm We don't work for nobody else. We want our own stuff. That's it. Give me my own stuff, I come to work every day. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he going to go his own field. And, like, I don't work for anybody. And even in, in both sides, in, in, in crime, I didn't work for nobody. I was, I was a, a street pharmaceutical rep. And, <laughs> and then now, you know, I do, I do stand up. And this, I haven't had a job since 1999. I got out in 97, late 97, going to 98. And I was hell bent on not working for nobody. I used to sell suits. And um, in Sharpstown, I worked in this place called Sharpstown Mall in a spot called Mosa. And I worked there as a, it's, it's crazy, Reginald Ballot was the person who gave me my shot because I went to his um, store for a whole week until he gave me a job. Because in my mind said, I'm out, I need clothes, what better place to work in, at a man's apparel store? So I went in, I said, hey, man, y'all hiring? He said, man, we not hiring. Came back the next day, I said, 
Hey, man, y'all hiring? He said, man, I told you we wouldn't hire. I said, man, I don't know somebody could got fired. I don't know. <laughs> so so I, um, I waited a couple of days, and I went there on the weekend. And I guess my face was familiar to him, and it was super busy. And he was like, say, man, we need some mock necks. And he just, I didn't know what a mock neck was. And he pointed to me, and I just went to the back of the stock room. I just went back there and was like, um, my man say he needs some mock necks. <laughs> and this dude just handed me a stack of... I didn't even know what a mock neck was at all. This must have been something new that it just came out. So I just went, I handed a stack of mock, and then for the rest of the day, I was just folding clothes and just helping people, taking stuff to the register and just moving around. I was just sitting there all day. So at the end, he closed the store, and he was like, man, we had a fantastic day, man. My man right here was, man, you don't work here? I'm like, hey, hey, man. I've been here all day. I went and got mock necks, everything. I ain't been on no lunch or nothing. And he hired me. I think I'm the only person ever hired on a Sunday. He hired me on a Sunday. When you think about what those old men told you, then when you hear somebody say, my vote is irrelevant. It means nothing. When you think about the 1.6 million men and women in Florida who are trying to get their voting rights restored, how does it make you feel? Um, like I'm doing a bad job at what, I, at what I'm supposed to be doing. In my, in my stand-up, I talk a lot about what we should do and how many people was lost and died for this right to vote and how voting is an act and it's, and it's not a law and how people are going through all this difficulty in voting and you just take it for granted. You know, it's a lot of people did a lot of things to vote. It wasn't just something that was handed over. You know how many of your ancestors, so when people talk to me about how black they are in their heart, I'm like, but you don't do nothing to honor the ancestors for the things that they put in front of you. They, it's, it's blood on those votes. You had, his people died and did all type of things in order for you and further in, in future generations to be able to vote and you take it for granted as it don't mean nothing. I think that most people just not informed enough on what to vote about and who to vote for. It's like you look on the, you look on the ballot, you'll see proposition one through 10. You don't know what any of the propositions are. Nobody educated you on prop one, how's it gonna directly affect your community? How's it gonna directly affect elderly? How's it gonna di directly affect the future? How do you not know and you vote for something blind? Or you don't vote for something blind? Or you see a name, you have no clue who this person is. And you just, oh, it's all Democrat. I'm gonna vote for everybody on the Democratic Party. Like, sometimes we be voting for people who ain't got no backbone. I still, I still think in my mind, who are the people that we voted for that we put in office that chose to accept that they couldn't nominate a Supreme Court justice. They accepted that. The Republicans told them they couldn't do it because it's a lame duck president. What you mean? Right. What do you mean? Which, which, is, which is one of the reasons, you know, and trust me, people were very upset with me, even in the Obama White House. Um, and I kept making the argument, again, as somebody who studied history, Dr. King always believed in a protagonist and an antagonist. Uh, the reason, uh, the Albany movement uh, in Albany, Georgia did not fully succeed. It's because the sheriff there was smart. He was college educated. He didn't act a fool in front of the cameras. He treated Dr. King and others with respect. When they got arrested, he was very cordial and very nice, and they could not tick him off. And that's one of the reasons why they felt Albany did not really succeed. Yet when they went to Birmingham, they had crazy ass Bull Connor. <laughs> and they knew exactly what they had. Yeah. I made the argument that, and I was doing it, and when I say I was doing it early, Scalia died hmm. on a Friday in Texas. I was in Toronto, the NBA All-Star Game, and I called several black women, Melanie Campbell, National, uh, the Black Women's Roundtable, hmm. Leah Daltrey, uh, former uh, top official of the Democratic National Committee, uh, called uh, uh, Dorothy uh, Buchanan, who was the international president of AKA, and I said, y'all need to be meeting by Sunday. 
I said, Obama needs to appoint a black woman to the Supreme Court. Hmm. He'd already appointed Justice Kagan and Justice Sotomayor. And the reason I felt that is because I felt to have, first of all, no black woman has ever been appointed to the Supreme Court. Not even considered. And then to have, knowing full well the Republicans were never gonna give a, do a hearing. I said, you would have this image of this eminently qualified black woman, historic appointment, and largely old white men, Republicans, saying, we not, forget a hearing, we're not even gonna meet with you. Mm. And I thought about that scene from the West Wing when hmm. the Martin Sheen character went down to Capitol Hill and he sat on the bench by himself and the Republicans wouldn't meet with him. I said, imagine that was the image. So between March and November, black women who hate the Republican Party more than anybody else. I mean, it ain't even close. A Republican, a black, a black Republican told me that. She said, black women hate us more than anybody else. Then you would have white women mad. You would have Latino women. You would have, so all those people, millennials and others, hmm. who, did, who were not happy with Hillary Clinton, you would have something that could galvanize people. Bro, I pleaded, I yelled and screamed. I, I, was, I was every black, all the people who met with Obama, all the civil rights people, I said, did anybody bring it up in the meeting? I'm like, what the hell, nobody brought it up in the meeting? And so then he point, pointed Mary Garland, I was like, look, I said, look, he may be very talented, we, we've had 113 white guys on the Supreme Court. Hmm. I mean, no, we had, no, at the point, it was, it was 112. I'm like, we had 106 out of 112. If this, that's like the Harlem Globetrotters playing the dog on uh, Washington Generals. <laughs> it was like, we good. We good. And I, but but it's just one of those examples I, I felt could have changed how folks voted and why they voted. And to this day, and I don't care, Obama can be mad at me all he want to, to this day, that was a huge mistake. Um, I would agree. I think that a lot of things during that, during that time were huge mistakes. As African American voters, we didn't ask for anything. We didn't, we, what did we ask for? During, during the time of his presidency, what did we actually galvanize together and ask for? Because a lot of people actually said, oh man, you know, brother got a lot going on, his plate is full. I said, yeah, but the return, That's his job. Uh, right. The point, I, so this, this is the example that I use. The example that I use is we were enamored that he was the first black president, but forgot he was the 44th. He I, was both at the same time. Yeah. Um, he was the first and the 44th. So what you asked of the previous 43, you should have asked of the 44th. So, <clears throat> it's a... It's a, it's a toss up. I don't think we, we even thought to ask. I was yelling, hey, why don't we, can we get, can be a, become a whole person in the Constitution? I would like that. You're a constitutional lawyer, you and your wife. I think y'all can work on that. that. That's a hard thing to ask. Cause see, when these kids be getting shot and saying, oh, you should, you should state your constitution right. Well, they don't feel like it, it um, applies to us. Which is why I think when we talk about we want folks to be woke and vote. Hmm. Voting is the end of one process, yeah. but the beginning of another. And so with this initiative, we want folks, we don't care whether you're millennial, whether you're Gen X, whether you're Gen Y, whether you're a uh, baby boomer, we don't care. I don't care what it is, we want you to vote. But the other thing is, is to get folks to understand that the day after election day, hmm. election day is November 6th, <clears throat> yep. On November 7th, it's a whole new campaign, it's a whole new ballgame. When you see these folks talking about mass incarceration, talking about these, again, you said it, George, George W. Bush, when he was running versus Ann Richards, oh, he gonna be tough on crime. That's all you hear from Donald Trump, law and order. Okay, he wins. Okay, now what we gonna do? The purge. Because <laughs> that's, what, that's, what that's what I see when, when I saw how they did with this with this immigrant thing they have multiple prisons in texas multiple prisons maybe 162 and just other holding facilities just scattered around in very rural areas mm -hmm. so they can hide you really well in this area like right along the border and in, in, in even in small towns like odessa midland they have three or four prisons tucked off in there in Hondu, Texas, all these little spots that you don't really think about. 
And mass incarceration, we hear it, we know what it is, but do we understand that these juvenile centers are a part of this mass incarceration? Mm -hmm. um, we, we've gotten to the point, this moral stain on the fabric of this, this country, we lock up our women. What type of country, what, what are we doing where it's so bad that we locking up women? Now all of Canada, they probably got 1,300 people locked up total, and 85% of them have mental conditions. 85% of them actually, you're, you're housed here because you're a danger to yourself and society because you're mentally incompetent. We have turned prison into a money-making mm -hmm. machine and I know that it's like cattle because the most important thing in prison is the count. We got to make sure all the bodies are here, all the cattle is here. And when you're doing that, then that means you have no consideration on how somebody got there or what the condition was where the person got there. So you, now you have all these, D, let's fill it up with DWI people. Let's fill it up with child support people. I don't understand this because people skip over this child support thing like it's not a large amount of people that's in there because they don't have the means to pay child support because back child support, I'm gonna lock you up for 180 days. And in some places it's a year, in some places it's more. So then when you get out, you still have the back child support and it's accruing interest. And you have no job. And you have no job. And now that you served, it's hard for you to get a job because you served. And I pick you up again for another 180 days. How is that serving the child? How is that serving me getting employment? How is that serving the community? What is this? It's not serving. It's filling somebody's pocket. Filling somebody's pocket. So how, from your vantage point, how do, how do we get large numbers of people to come to understand that doing nothing, sitting at home, and, and just believing that this is just a waste of my time actually is a detriment to them? and their family, and their friends, and their loved one, and their community, and the neighborhood, and the city, and the state, and the nation. Wow, how do we get that? If we could get Lil Wayne, Drake, the Migos, Cardi B, Beyonce, Jay-Z, Kanye, we gotta get every person that they listening to, to say something informational and positive about voting because it, they not listening to the average just vote. Let's, let, we got to have to do some skits about why and what happens when you don't vote. It, it, you know, when you don't vote, then you have no community. You're like, hey, they changed Dialing Street to emancipation. I don't want that. Did you vote? Did you, because they asked, they asked. You know, you gotta get, you gotta hit people where they, where they stand at. Like, understand what you're not getting by not voting. Let me, let me give you a concept of, hey, you know you could have this, and this school could be better. It could have this in this school, but you know how you get that? By voting. But you don't want to. You don't want to vote. What you need me to do? You want me to put a, a food truck in front of every voting stand? I'm handing out as you vote. Get your hot plate as you as you walk off. You know what do I need to do to get you to understand that this is? Oh, I, do I need to get a bus and and drive around and go to every elderly home and pick them up? Pick them up. Tell them we we doing it's bingo. You know what I'm saying? Pick, pick them up. <laughs> they gonna get on that bus. They, they, they're going to bingo. And we got free divers too. <laughs> so, so. But see, to that, but see, the, the thing is, to that point when you talk about, you talk about entertainers, influencers. And what's crazy, I'm, I'm, and I hate the fact that I even said it because I'm tired 
of trying to dance to give you information. But, Why I just can't give you information? But because here's the here's the thing though, because the reality is, again, if one is a student of the movement, and most people don't, they don't realize the influence that music had on the Black Freedom Movement. Brown. Not not just the not just the Freedom Singers, not just the Fist Jubilee Singers. The reality is when they were marching from Selma to when they were when they were finishing the James Meredith march. Uh, after he had gotten shot, um, and the role that James Brown played, yeah. the Temptations, the Motown. People forget Motown actually recorded Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech August 28, 1963. Motown actually put the speech out as an album. Aretha Franklin, Dr. King told Diane Carroll and Sidney Poitier, look, we need y'all to do what y'all supposed to do. We don't, we don't need to have y'all at the march. They were raising, Diane Carroll was raising money in New York apart, her New York apartment for the movement. Sidney Poitier told me the story, which is unbelievably hilarious, of when him and Harry Belafonte had a bag of $100,000. They, they were flying down to Mississippi. And then uh, uh, the Klansmen heard they were there and how they were sitting here, man, with the lights out, driving down these dirt roads or whatever, evading these Klansmen. And they got to the uh, they got to the uh, room, and Sidney Poitier said to Harry Belafonte, "If your ass ever asked me to come down here, again, <laughs> I will kill you." But when Sidney went into that room with them with with, with 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 them brothers and sisters, he saw the importance of it. The reality is, Ossie Davis, Ruby D, Dick Gregory, we can go down the whole line. That's my Cats name. put it on the line. That I think. So the reality is, our story is one of. Paul Robeson, uh, the poets, uh, Harlem Renaissance. Uh, you talk about Langston Hughes. Langston. When you talk about all, so, what you're saying is actually not outside the realm of possibility because that's actually our story. The yeah. storytellers, the artists, they were the ones who actually said we got a role to play. But you got to get to them. Got to get to them, and. The, the role that I play, I, I, I'm, I'm inching, I keep inching along to wherever, what my role is gonna be and how I'ma figure this path out to get to them. Cause I'm, I'm a, I'ma figure it out. And the more I keep talking, people get mad at me and I understand, and I understand you know, the first time me and you talked, it was, it was a, a, back and, a back and forth. And then I came out and said what I said about the music industry, not putting out any, rap music, positive rap music since 1992, it was a plan, and you was the first one to stand up and clap for it. It was like, I think a lot of people, I, I'm never in my feelings about anything. I can agree with you and disagree with you, but one thing I understand, we on the same course for the same thing. Whether, whatever your method is, if I can assist with your method, I'm not gonna derail it. I'm gonna try to assist with it. And I think a lot of times we get derailed in things and, and fascinated. I, I didn't understand how so many people was listening to Dr. Umar Johnson, and I was very irritated with it. It was like a, a lot of fluff and showmanship, and, and I, I would ask the question, why are we begging somebody to donate for a school, to, to, to buy a school, but you're not trying to buy no land to build the school that you want? I don't understand the process, I don't understand the process, but it, I'm... Well, keep, you gotta keep in mind, of course, when, when I had him on my show, we went at it. I, I, and, I saw and, it. And all these people, they, they still commenting mad and upset, and I'm going, so y'all mad because I dared ask questions. Yeah. When actually the easiest thing to do is just simply just to answer the question, but it was like, how dare you even ask the question? And then of course I would have people who would call me uh, coon, call me nigger, and I said, I said, I do get, I said, it does amaze me that there are individuals who call themselves black liberators, that you use the same language of the oppressors, but you so-called have consciousness. That's what I, man, you took the words right out of my mouth. It was like, it, it, it's a thing. People say, well, Dr. Umar, it did. I said, if he's so woke, why he calling himself black? I said, that's your skin color? I said, if you ask my son, my son as a, as a child, Hassan at five years old came and said, daddy, black people steal. 
I said, who told you that? He said, they always talking about black people stealing. I said, how did that make you feel, Hassan? They don't make me feel no type of way. I said, it don't make you feel no type of way? Not, uh, don't feel nothing. I said, why? He said, because daddy, I'm not black. I said, Hassan, what color are you? Brown. <laughs> I said, what color am I, Hassan? Brown. I went to the darkest person I could think of. I said, what color is Uncle Nap? He said, dark brown. <laughs> <laughs> And he's like, um, I thought you were supposed to be classified by your nationality. He said, because I'm not a color. He said, that's just not who I am. And then by being in Spanish school, he knows what that color is in Spanish. He's like, no, no, not happening, not happening. <laughs> and you can't call this man. You cannot tell. What's up, strong black man? He was like, brown. <laughs> Strong brown man. Because <laughs> he, in his mind, he's brown. And he's like, where, where did that concept come from? And then, and in his mind, you, if you ask this man who is the first president, this is when I knew Hassan was going to have to be homeschooled. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is when I knew. I was like, yeah, he, um, he going to have to be homeschooled. Um, and why is the name right in my head and, I, and I'm not able to say, he, he's at school and John Hanson. Um, lady asked him who was the first president and he said John Hanson. First black, first black president. Yeah, first black president. Right. First president period. He's the man said John Hanson. And the lady was like, no, George Washington. He's like, nope, John Hanson. <laughs> and then, it, and, and you argue with that point, he was like, well, the first president actually created the national treasury too. Who was that? And he was like, John Hanson. <laughs> Cause he, when he say who was that, he gonna say John Hanson cause he know you don't, he know you don't know the answer. Cause he's like, John Hanson's the first president. You're not gonna tell him nothing different. And he said, now prove, prove me otherwise. And he said, George Washington voted for him. So now prove me otherwise. And that's his mind, that's his mindset. And so you can't, anything that you say like you can't, cause it's what he sees. African American men don't own businesses. He's like, well, well, my daddy friends own businesses. Every last one of them. African American men don't take care of their kids. Well, I don't. Like a brother, a brother told him that he didn't. His daddy didn't stay with him. Hassan was a mate. Like what? What you mean? Your daddy don't. Your daddy, daddy <laughs> don't live with you. Like your real daddy don't live in your house with you. Boy, that's wild. He's like, what? But you hear that all the time. Right. But he goes through every last one of my friends. Keelan Farouk, Marcus D. Wiley, Dave Lawson. He'll go through all of them. He's like, I know all their children. I know them and their wife. I don't understand. What are you talking about? He, Keelan owns this business. His sister owns this business. His mama helped with this business. Um, Uncle Knapp owns this business. Uncle Jay owns this business. Um, Jason owns Midtown Barbershop. Everywhere I go, I see African-American people owning something. So what are you talking about? And I'm homeschooled, so I don't, I don't go to school. That's how, that's how tell you, I don't go to school. I go to my house. So I think he will be voting. Yeah, if he, can, if he can vote, right? How old is he? He's six, he's seven right now. Let me tell you, last year, <laughs> last, I, last year, the funniest thing I guess it was the year before last, Trump. Trump called, um, um, Pink, you, what's the man in uh, Korea called him? Little Rocket Man. Yeah, yeah. Man. Kim. My son was, because I watched the news, and so he watched the news. I asked him, he was on the way to the restaurant. I said, Hassan, where are you going? Little Rocket Man <laughs> is on a road for destruction. I mean, because <laughs> he was just, he was quoting Trump. <laughs> Everything Trump said, he was just quoting Trump. He had a song that he made up. Donna, Donna, Trump, Trump, Trump. <laughs> so like, and I was in the grocery store. He was singing that song. I was like, and black people just looking at me. I'm like, I don't know why <laughs> he is fascinated with Trump. But Trump drew his attention. He wasn't watching nobody else but Trump. He was just like, in his mind, whatever he thought that that man was saying, whether he agreed with it or disagreed with it, he was watching it. So what we should be doing then, we should be, how about this? 
Because what happens is, when we have these discussions, we have older folks talking about how do we get millennials to vote. To me, what really should be happening is Hassan and Little Miss Flint and my nieces, we actually should be using them saying, hey, I need y'all to vote because I can't because I can't do it for about another 11 years. Exactly. So don't mess this shit up until I'm able to get my vote. <laughs> Sorry, man. That's what I mean, I, again, so I, again, because if we don't, if we don't get folks to understand that decisions made today are gonna impact them, then that's changing people's minds to get, the, like when I give speeches, I tell them like, no, no, the decisions you make today are gonna impact your children's children's children. Yeah. These are legacy decisions you're making. Legacy decisions. And politics are the same way. And I think people don't understand how important that is because they think that the vote is right now. Oh no, this, this, uh, this appointment to, this, to the Supreme Court, that's a big thing. That's, gonna, that's a ripple effect forever. 2043, America will be a nation majority of people of color and Kavanaugh potentially will still be on the Supreme Court in 2043. Yeah. Women women in this country and I and I and I plead and I beg and I and and whatever I have to do to make them understand that they have to look out for their children. And they are being this this last move how they just dominated this if women would have really just put their foot down, you know something? We not moving. No more, no more movement on our end. We're not showing up to nothing because this was the most. I, I, was, I was a man that was literally sitting like this. Like, are they rallying around the wagon right now because they want this man this bad? I literally watched them abandon the plan. We're just gonna have this lady ask everybody all the questions. Right. And they, once she asked him a question that they never went back to because it incriminated him. The phone call was made, abandoned that mission, and they never asked him one question. They just berated the procedure. Mm -hmm. And how is that, how can somebody, how can fathers sit back and look at a woman that was very candid, that was very convincing, and was very detailed, detailed to the point that even the littlest mistake meant something to her. No, 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 let me correct that. And for somebody to come out, I haven't been guilty before. I haven't been guilty before. And I watched Kavanaugh do a classic inmate move. The louder you talk and the more passion you put to it, you trying to sell it. Because what you're, you're guilty, but you got to put all this on it. And this is a, and what, and, and it's amazing that you were so, I'm talking about zero to 60. You a Democrat, you asking me questions. I'm, and what is, and the Republican, and um, no, and I remember that very clearly, and yes. Like, and then, and then, who is this psychomaniac that you were watching on TV and you say, you know something? He's a good person, even kill person to be on the Supreme Court as I just watched this man Jekyll and Hyde right in front of my face. And then you said the feds don't do nothing and I was sitting there, I begged to differ because I got busted by the feds. They did a hell of an investigation on me <laughs> and, and, and came back with more than just 302s, whatever he said. <laughs> they came back with all type of indictments. It was insane. You got 30 seconds, you meet a young person, you meet somebody who's older, Man, woman, doesn't matter, anywhere in the country. And they say, Ali, man, this crap don't mean nothing. Voting is a waste of my time. I'm not even gonna put any energy into it. You got 30 seconds, it's all you have. 
you getting in, you leaving a comedy show, you getting in the car, going to the airport, that's all you got. What do you tell them in 30 seconds? In 30 seconds, if voting don't mean anything, what's gonna happen if you don't? Give me, give me the next step. What's replacing it? Where's your voice being heard at? How do you put your, your grievances out in front? How do you put forth your ideas if you don't vote on it? Tell me. Now you, I, I wanna know if it don't work, then tell me what will work. You have, you have nothing? You have nothing? I think, you don't have, I think you should vote, historically. A lot of blood on that vote. You should vote. Oh, 29 seconds. <laughs> Ali Sadiq, I appreciate it. Oh, man. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. Hey fam, want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered, the blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. Want to check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. Press play. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RollerMartinUnfiltered.com.